Hello, welcome back to Dinosaurs. Today is the last lecture in module one. So congratulations, we've made it through the first three weeks. We've talked a little bit about microevolution, so evolution within a species. We've talked about macroevolution, basically speciation, the creation of new species. And today we're gonna to talk about phylogeny and cladistics, basically how we lump together these species to assemble their evolutionary history, their phylogeny, and uh, how we analyze them with cladistic uh, trees. But before we do that, some announcements. Uh, okay, so let's review. So last time we talked about macroevolution, which is a good example of macroevolution. So of these examples down here, which of these is an example of macroevolution? So think about the distinction between micro and macro, which of these is an example of macroevolution? Okay, so macroevolution, speciation, new species arising, uh, the difference between Homo sapiens and Homo neanderthalensis is an example of macroevolution, speciation. Uh, in some ways, a mass extinction event is also a macroevolutionary process, although I like to kind of separate evolution and extinction as kind of two different things. But of course, the ends of these branches is dominated by extinction events. So you kind of maybe have to think of them together. Uh, herbicide resistant weeds, that's just microevolution, gradual changes within that weed species. You're not actually creating a new weed species. And then of course, the differences between dog breeds. Dog breeds can look radically different from each other, but they can still successfully interbreed. They still recognize each other as dogs they are still the same species. And so it's still an example of microevolution, subtle, tiny changes, and in some cases, not so tiny changes within a species without actually creating a new species. Uh, okay, so uh, we also talked about some evolutionary changes. So like if a species gets, if a population gets isolated and separated, how they'll start adapting to their environment so according to the Bergman and Allen rules, which of these forms is better adapted to a cold climate? So let's say that they started out as very similar to each other, a common shared population. And then there was some splitting event where one portion of the population was isolated in a colder climate, one portion was isolated in a warmer climate, uh, which adaptations here, which traits would be favored in a cold climate? So take a look. And the answer is uh, our pal Big Chungus. So it's an internet meme. Uh, I'm not entirely sure where it came from or what it is, but uh, it's gigantic Bugs Bunny for some reason. Uh, but uh, the reducing surface area with respect to volume, that's an adaptation to a cold climate. Adaptation to the warmer climate, the longer limbs, longer ears, acting as radiators, uh, slimmer features to increase surface area with respect to body volume to get rid of heat. Uh, and so obviously this is not the only factor here on size and shape, but this is one factor. So keep these in mind going forward. So, uh, all right, so let's get into it. So uh, we've seen this slide before, we saw it last time, but uh, we talked about macroevolution. We're going to later talk about macroevolution of dinosaurs, but I just want to kind of introduce it a little bit more here. So again, like changes in environment, changes in geography, changes in location, being isolated, populations become isolated, they adapt to their new environment. Over time, that causes splits and speciations, macroevolution over time, and also over space. Again, remember that not all dinosaurs lived at the same time and not all dinosaurs lived in the same place. Certain dinosaurs were restricted to certain continents or certain areas of continents and certain dinosaurs lived in the Jurassic, certain lived in the Cretaceous, certainly lived in the Triassic all throughout the Mesozoic. They lived at different times in different places and we now have the job of trying to lump them into clads. So we're trying to lump the dinosaur species that we see, the different dinosaur species, trying to lump them into clads 
based on shared characteristics that we ultimately assume are the result of a shared evolutionary history or what we call phylogeny. Uh, we'll talk about this in detail later, but again, you've seen this slide before. The end result here is that dinosaurs are split into these major groups, these major clads, based on their common characteristics, again, resulting from a common evolutionary history. So if we look at all of the dinosaurs, there's a major split into two orders. These are actually two entirely different modules later on in the course. There's the ornithischian, the bird-hipped dinosaurs, and there's the saurischians, the lizard-hipped dinosaurs. Uh, of the ornithischians, there are these major clads. There's the ceratopsia, the horn-faced ornithopoda, the bird-footed pachycephalosaur, the thick-headed stegosaurus, the rook-roofed lizards, <laughs> uh, ankylosaurs, the fused lizards, the plates are fused, they're like tanks. Uh, the sauropods, uh, sorry, sauropods, the lizard-footed, and then theropods, the beast-footed. These are the major clads that we'll be talking about later. They're the major lumps of dinosaur species based on shared characteristics, based on shared evolutionary history. And we'll get into that in a lot of detail later, but how did we get to this? What is a clad? How do you build this branching tree, which we call a cladogram. So how do you construct a cladogram? Well, the first step is that you need to construct, or the first step is that you should construct, it makes life a lot easier, is that you make a table based on characters, a character table, and then you see whether the organism has it, has this character or not. So in this case, it's a binary sort of zero, means that the organism does not have that trait. One means that it does. So uh, if we look at this thing, this these characters, uh, these are the organisms that we're going to try to lump into a cladogram. There is one, two, three, four, five, six different organisms. And if we're going to make a cladogram tree, we need at least one minus the number of organism traits, because ultimately on the tree, each node is a trait. And I'll show you an example in a second here. But uh, if we're going to try to split six organisms into six groups, we need at least five characters to differentiate them. So for example, in this case, we've chosen the presence or absence of a vertebral column, a spinal column, the presence or absence of hinged jaws, four walking legs, uh, amnion, the eggs, or hair. So these are the characters that they've chosen, the people that built this tree, they chose these characters. Why these characters? Because it makes a relatively simple tree, but perhaps you would choose different characters. We'll talk about that in just a second, but what you do now is, so for a vertebral column, the lancelet does not have a vertebral column. It has a very primitive notochord. All the other organisms here do, and so they all get a one. So that's the first branch. The lancelets are on here on this branch all by themselves. They do not have a vertebral column. All the rest of them down this branch do. Now we need to further separate. We need another feature that's gonna separate out one of these critters. And so in this case, it's hinged jaws. Vertebral column, lamprey have a vertebral column. They do not have hinged jaws. They have this weird uh, jagged kind of toothy jaw. You'll see they kind of latch on the fish, uh, but it's like a, a ring kind of mouth. It's not hinged. They don't chomp, they kind of are more like sucker. So hinged jaws, bass do have hinged jaws, chomp, chomp. Frogs have hinged jaws, turtles have hinged jaws, leopards have hinged jaws. Everything down this part of the tree has hinged jaws. The next character that they choose is four walking legs. Bass don't have legs. Lamprey don't have legs. Lancelets don't have legs. Frogs, 
turtles and leopards do. The next characteristic, again, amnion, turtles lay eggs, leopards don't, leopards have hair, turtles don't, and so on. That's how they construct this tree. So first you look at the characters. If you're trying to characterize six different organisms, you need at least five traits because at the end, each of these nodes, each of these branching sections becomes a trait. And you see that this is a relatively simple tree uh, and this becomes a little bit more complex. You can get pretty complex with this. So let's look at an example here. So uh, here's some organisms. How many organisms are there that we're gonna try to put into this tree? There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There's seven organisms, which means to separate them out, we need a brand, a tree that has six nodes, which means we need six different characteristics to separate them out. So we need at least six traits. Uh, so the first question that probably jumps to mind is, uh, which traits should we use? Which traits are important? And which traits aren't important? Well, it kind of depends on the purpose of your cladogram, but we're trying to separate these things out. So like if I want to use has two eyes as a trait, well, let's see, primates have two eyes, rodents have two eyes, sharks have two eyes, crocodiles have two eyes, birds have two eyes, amphibians have two eyes, and the fish have two eyes. That doesn't do anything to separate out any of these creatures. Okay, let's try spinal column. Again, all of these things are vertebrates. They've got a spinal column. Sharks are cartilaginous, but it's there. Uh, that doesn't help us either. Okay, well, what traits are important? We wanna think about what separates this out. So like, uh, well, uh, so the primate has hair, so does the rodent, but the others don't. That's a good way to kind of start separating things. Um, what about bones? So again, I said that the sharks are cartilaginous. Um, they don't have bones. All these others do. Uh, so that's, that's interesting. That might work. Um, what about like laying eggs? Mm, primates don't lay eggs. Rodents don't lay eggs. Uh, some sharks give live birth. Um, that's actually a trait that it's an example of convergent evolution that comes later. Um, but these other things lay eggs. So that's a trait that might work. Okay, so let's look at a valid cladogram that lumps these organisms. And so this is a simplified tree of these. So this is the cladogram quote unquote answer. Now, if you took the time to make your own cladogram with these organisms and figure out your own traits, build your own character table, uh, there might be other traits that you would have used so does that mean that your cladogram is wrong because this one is right? The answer is no. This isn't the only answer. This isn't the only way to lump these. Uh, why did we focus on these particular traits, which I'll walk through in a second? The answer is those are the ones we chose. Those are the ones that we placed value on. Those are the ones that we thought best discriminated these groups into related clads that share a common evolutionary history with each other. Uh, you might use something else, but let's walk through. So again, uh, vertebrae, all of these animals have vertebrae. That's the primitive characteristic of all of these. Sharks have vertebrae. Uh, bony skeleton, sharks do not have a bony skeleton. Rafined fish and everything this way does. Four limbs, Fish do not have four limbs. Everything this way on the tree does. Amniotic egg, so like an egg with a shell or an internal egg in the case of mammals. Um, amphibians don't have a hard shell. They have to lay their eggs in water. They're subject to the environment. All of these are not. Then there's kind of the split between the placental egg and the eggs with shells. Crocodiles and birds lay eggs with shells. Mammals have internal eggs that develop in the placenta as the quote unquote egg. So this is a cladogram that lumps these organisms into groups, into clads. There's probably other ways of drawing this. How do we know which one's right? 
Uh, generally, the answer is it's the simplest one. So if you've ever heard the expression uh, kiss, keep it simple, stupid, that works with cladograms. If your cladogram's all over the place and it has many different branches, that's probably not the best answer if you can simplify it. Uh, as you can see behind me, in some cases, the cladograms do get very complicated. Uh, is this the simplest answer? Uh, probably not. There's probably ways that you could make this better and simpler. Does that mean it's more correct? Not necessarily. But this is not a unique solution. This is not a unique solution. There are ways of doing this. Remember that everything beyond species is artificial. And so the way that we draw these branches, the way that we draw these clads, uh, it's subjective. There's some opinion to this. Uh, now, we're trying to get to a tree that shows us the actual evolutionary history. And so if we knew precisely that evolutionary history, there is a right answer, but we'll probably never get that far where we know what the answer is. And so this is an attempt to get closer and closer. And so keep in mind that these trees are hypotheses. So these are our current best guesses, educated guesses, guess is a very bad word, uh, our current best understanding of the relationships, our current best understanding of the evolutionary descent, the relationships of these organisms with each other, their phylogeny, their shared evolutionary history. So these trees are hypotheses. So this is a cladogram trying to group together all these different organisms horses, hippos, pigs, ruminants, camels, whales, and mesonicids. <laughs> um, we're trying to group these different groups together. And this is how it used to be drawn. Why? Because uh, if you look at a hippo, do you think that a hippo is more closely related to a pig or to a whale? How many different characteristics, morphological characteristics, external characteristics, superficial characteristics does a hippo share with a pig versus how much does it share with a whale? Well, in my personal opinion, the hippo looks a hell of a lot more like a pig than it does to a whale. And so pigs and hippos were placed on kind of the same branch here, sharing a common ancestor back here, whereas whales share a common ancestor with hippos way back here on this branch. And so in this interpretation here, hippos and whales are evolutionarily fairly distant from each other, and they're much closer to pigs based on their superficial similarities. This was a hypothesis. Uh, this hypothesis has since been sh shown to be wrong based on DNA evidence. So as we have advanced in our understanding of genetics and DNA and our technology for sequencing DNA, and our ability to process all of that data and filter all that data. Uh, this is the new cladogram. And now you see that hippos and whales are on the same branch, more closely related to each other. And then hippos and pigs only have a common ancestor way back here. And so hippos and pigs are more distantly related than hippos and whales. Again, this is sort of counterintuitive because a hippo looks a lot more like a pig than it does a whale, but DNA evidence, the evolutionary history, the fossil record shows that hippos and whales are actually closer, more closely related than they are to pigs. So it doesn't have to make sense. In a lot of cases, it doesn't. But with DNA, we, we get closer to the right answer. Again, this, this tree even though it's the latest and greatest, remember science is a process. Over time, we test our hypotheses. If it stands up to all the data that we have, we keep it for now, uh, but new data is coming in all the time and something might prove that this thing's wrong and then we throw it out and we make a new tree and then people get more evidence and they start challenging that tree. And over time, we start to get to a better and better solution. Do we ever arrive at the truth Probably not, but we get closer every time and our understanding increases every time and we're able to piece together the evolutionary relationships, the phylogeny of these organisms, their descent, how they're related to each other through time. 
it gets better and better and better, but it's never going to be perfect, probably. There's always going to be problems, and we need to recognize that with science. Science is the process by which we slowly get better and closer to a truth that's probably always going to evade us, but we're always getting closer to it. Uh, another thing to keep in mind is that trees are not progressive. So one common misunderstanding, for example, there is an evolutionary tree behind me here. Uh, we've got something here closer to the base of the tree. And then we've got some of these things farther out on the terminal branches. They're farther along on the tree. Some people interpret that as they are more advanced or they're more specialized, better adapted to their environment, or they're more extreme in that they're like highly specialized and focused to, to a niche such that they couldn't survive elsewhere. They're not generalists anymore. Uh, remember that these are wrong. <laughs> uh, trees show only evolutionary closeness. They don't imply a directionality. So evolution's not a ladder. Evolution is not this stepwise process where organisms get better and better and better and greater and greater and greater until finally uh, humanity, the, the king of all animals, uh, evolved. That's not how this works. It's a tree. Uh, humans are a branch of the tree. So are fish, so are insects, so are plants. Are humans more advanced than fish? Well, certainly not for an underwater environment. Fish are way more advanced and well adapted and more fit to that environment than humans are. Uh, there's all that saying like, don't judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree or a fish riding a bicycle or something like that. Every animal existing on earth today is evolved and adapted to its niche in its environment and they're fit for that environment and other organisms are not, or they'd be occupying that environment. Uh, certain invasive species that were separated by space rather than like niche fit, uh, that's a little bit of an exception, but uh, evolution is not a ladder. And again, this march of progress, that's a huge misunderstanding with evolution. Chimpanzees, first of all, they're not our direct ancestor. We didn't evolve from chimpanzees chimpanzees and us split off from a trunk of the tree uh, of about like, I think it's like four to six million years ago, maybe longer than that. Um, we've been evolving on different branches since then. We didn't evolve from chimpanzees. That question like if we evolve from chimps, why are there still chimps? We didn't evolve from chimps. We evolved from a common ancestor that we share with chimps in the ancient geologic past not quite so ancient, but ancient. This is wrong. This steady progress towards us is wrong. We're not climbing a ladder. We're on a tree, we're on a branch, and our branch is just as important, just as valued, just as special as all of the other branches. So let's look at humans. <laughs> let's make ourselves special for a second here. Uh, human evolution is an interesting story, and it's changing all the time. It's changing very rapidly. Uh, there's been a lot of recent advances in this field as we get new information. New fossils are found, new species are found, and new trees are drawn. We're constantly erasing this and starting over and redrawing these branches. Uh, this is, again, a hypothesis of these evolutionary relationships. Uh, one thing you'll notice is that as you get farther back, in geologic time, there starts to be a lot more question marks. So why is that? Remember that the rock record is not perfect. The fossil record is not perfect. The farther we get away from today, the more gaps there are, the more pages of that geologic history, the more pages that geologic story have been ripped out. Uh, we can, in some cases, read the story still from the context of what's around it. Again, just like if you fall asleep watching a movie, if you wake up five minutes later, you can probably piece the story together. If you wake up an hour later, you're probably not going to be so fortunate. So the farther back in time we go, the longer that gap is, the less complete the record is, the more challenging this becomes. But again, if we think back to microevolution, microevolution, the idea that 
organisms change through time, through slow, incremental, gradual changes that are the results of random genetic mutations creating random physical expressions that are then acted upon very non-randomly by natural selection to either favor or not favor those traits. Microevolution is those slow, steady changes. And for a long time, it was sort of microevolution. When we go to speciation, speciation macroevolution was just a scale up of those processes. Eventually, all the small changes added up to enough big changes that it was different species. Uh, that might not be really how it happens. So remember, isolation probably plays a key. So remember, allopatric speciation, the isolation or parapatric speciation, finding a new niche. Uh, that's generally how it happens. Uh, and it might be actually fairly quick. We'll talk about that in just a second. But uh, again, we've got these branches. We've got these relatively closely spaced relatives. Uh, where are all the intermediate forms? Well, you will see that there's really not a lot of room anymore for intermediate forms. We've filled in a lot of the gaps that did exist. But there are still spaces in between here, these quote unquote missing links. Uh, so where are these things? So one idea is that it was the effect of the rock record. So again, uh, early on in evolutionary theory, the idea was that things kind of split off on these clads. They speciated based on slow, gradual, tiny incremental changes. And that any gaps that we see, any big jumps that we see is an artifact of an imperfect record. So here we've got uh, steady uh, incremental, not progressive uh, evolution on these trees. And then we tear out some pages of the geologic record, tear out some more pages of the geologic record, tear out even more. And now we try to piece the relationships back together. Uh, one thing you'll note is that with the gaps in here, uh, they actually reconstructed the tree in a different way. Uh, one and two were actually, in truth, on the same branch. And now two and three are on the same branch with the reconstruction. So again, these trees are hypotheses. Uh, if this is the actual truth of what happened, this is wrong. This is a wrong interpretation, a wrong hypothesis. Eventually, we'll see that this link here doesn't actually exist. And it links back to here. But are these gaps a function of problems with the rock record? So do we have a record of incremental gradual change over time that just apparently looks abrupt, a big jump, because pages are torn out, rocks are missing? Again, think about the missing links. Even if we find all the missing links and plug in the gaps, it just makes a new missing link on both sides. If we double the data points, we double the gaps. It's, uh, there's no way to ever fill in everything. We're not gonna do that. The nature of the fossil record prohibits it. So this was kind of the idea was that evolution slow and steady over time, incremental gradual changes, and that any big jumps that we see, any big speciation events that we see, macroevolutionary processes that we observe are basically just a result of microevolutionary processes. But um, Eldridge and Gould start in the 70s had sort of this big revolution of, well, what if the gaps are actually real? Uh, what if evolution is very quick and the gaps are relatively short periods and there are pretty quick jumps from one species to another and that macroevolution isn't really just microevolution scaled up, but there's something kind of fundamentally different working. There has to be like an isolation, some, some kind of environmental pressure that all of a sudden accelerates the change process. So what they observed is that when you look at the fossil record, uh, there's a lot of species that remain completely unchanged for hundreds of millions of years. Trilobites evolved over the course of 200 million years, and they changed very little. Uh, there was a lot of diversification of body plan, but in general, they're very easily recognizable as that's a trilobite. Uh, horseshoe crabs are relatively unchanged for all the way back to 400 million years. They're relatively static. The coelocanth, the coelocanth was thought to be extinct. It was discovered alive 
in the 1900s. So we thought it was extinct forever. Now we've actually found one. We know there's several now. Um, that was relatively unchanged for massive amounts of geologic time. So uh, it seems like uh, this idea that slow and steady changes happen, uh, that's maybe true for some, but it's not true for everything. Some organisms don't change at all for long periods of time. So the species sort of stays static and does not evolve. It's, it's fit for its niche. It does its job well. There's no environmental pressure on it to change. It's doing good. No harm, no foul. If it's not broke, don't fix it. Uh, and then all of a sudden something changes and there's a rapid response and they speciate into a different species. They branch off. There's a speciation event, macroevolution. And then they adapt, they're adapted to that environment. And again, okay, fine, we're adapted to this new environment. We don't need to change at all uh, until there's another upheaval. So this was really kind of revolutionary in that um, macroevolution is not necessarily the result of just microevolution over time. Things sometimes don't change at all, and then sometimes they're forced to change rapidly. Uh, or they don't and they go extinct. So when environment changes rapidly, organisms change rapidly, or they don't and they die off. And so this was a pretty radical interpretation that, okay, well, a lot of the gaps that we're seeing in the fossil record maybe aren't just solely the result of problems with the record. It's not solely that pages are torn out. It's just that the author wrote really quickly and maybe missed a couple details along the way, uh, and it's harder to keep up, but the details are there. It's just that the change was really quick and difficult to discern in the fossil record with the degree of uh, resolution that we have. Uh, so which model is correct? Uh, again, what does correct mean? What does truth mean? <laughs> uh, we can never really know what's true. We just get closer and closer to true over time. <clears throat> so which model is correct? Whenever you ask a question like that, the answer is very often everyone's favorite. Uh, it depends. Uh, you'll find that if you go down the path of becoming a scientist, uh, or even really any field, the answer to a lot of very specific questions that seemingly have simple answers is it depends. It's never as simple as we think it is. The more you know about a topic, oftentimes the dumber you feel. Uh, there's details that you didn't even know existed before that now you're not sure of. Uh, whereas before you knew it at a vague concept and you're like, okay, well, I, I understand how this works. The more you know about the details, the more you see the unanswered questions, the more you see the gaps, and the more you're like, do we really know what's actually happening here? Are we comfortable with our understanding of this? So uh, again, in this case, it's one of these very famous examples. Is evolution gradual over time? Is macroevolution just a scaled up version of microevolution? Or is speciation a result of something kind of fundamentally different whereby organisms remain slowly unchanged and then they're forced to adapt quickly to a changing environment? The answer is probably both. Again, if a very common thing is you're faced with this choice between is it this or is it this, uh, usually the answer that it's a little bit of both. Sometimes it's one, sometimes it's the other, sometimes it's a combination. So uh, in this case, the best answer probably is that uh, if an organism has very little incentive uh, to change, that nothing in the environment is putting pressure on it, it's able to ob obtain resources very efficiently, it's able to reproduce very efficiently, there's no environmental challenges that are un, uh, un, un, unable to be overcome. Uh, there's no reason natural selection isn't really selecting on them. All the organisms are able to adapt perfectly fine and fit into their niche perfectly fine. Nothing's being filtered out. And so there's natural selection kind of isn't working on there. It's not forcing them to evolve in one direction or another. It's not favoring any individual traits because the organism is not under a lot of pressure. And so it doesn't change. Horseshoe crabs have been horseshoe crabbing for 400 million years. 
because they do what they do and they do it really well and there's no reason for them to change and they don't. There's no natural selection pressure on a horseshoe crab to become a slightly better horseshoe crab over time because they're already pretty damn good at horseshoe crabbing. Now, organisms that are occupying really heavily divided geographic isolation, geographic barriers, or if there is really complex habitat with a lot of different niches, a lot of division of resources, or even resource scarcity, or non-random mating habits, whereby there's pressure to evolve towards certain characteristics to be selected by a mate, uh, these organisms tend to speciate rapidly. And, and so basically the, the too long didn't read version of this is that uh, if there's very little environmental pressure towards change, an organism is probably not going to change. It's going to remain static. If the environment is pressuring the organism and there are challenges to surviving, certain of those organisms is, are going to be better adapted than others. And the ones that are not adapted well will die out and the ones that are will be favored. Natural selection will work well. And in some cases it'll work quickly and they'll evolve rapidly. And so this is probably the model here. And we'll talk about all of this in the context of dinosaurs later on in the class. But again, this was just to kind of set the stage. Uh, so that's all we got for today. This lecture was a little shorter than normal. Just make sure that you go do the module assessment. And that's all I got for today. I hope you enjoy your weekend and goodbye.